I'm very pleased to welcome as our guest the world's leading contralto, a genuine Canadian superstar, Toronto's own Maureen Forrester. Our subject, the woman, the artist, the mother of five. Maureen Forrester, for most of us, our lives are quite ordinary, and one of the things we feed on are our fantasies about great stars. And I wonder if you'd tell us some of the great artistic moments in your life as the world's leading contralto. I'm sort of nonplussed, and I don't think of myself as, as a great star. I'm just an ordinary person doing what I really like to do best in the world, and it's to sing. It's the only thing I know how to do well. <laughs> I'm a fair cook, but... but the sort of prime things in my life, I guess, are when uh, everybody's mother is very ambitious for them. My mother had little plateaus for me, and one was, would I be the soloist of St. James United Church in Montreal? Made it. Would I do the Messiah with Sir Ernest McMillan in the Toronto Symphony in, in uh, Toronto, you know, at Christmas time? Did that. Would I ever sing with the New York Philharmonic? And did that with a marvelous, marvelous conductor by the name of Bruno Walter, right. who was a great Mahler specialist. And since I'm sort of uh, known for the works of Mahler, because he wrote music that was for my type of voice, for a low voice and a little bit uh, sentimental type of person, um, this this was one of the great peaks of my career, that first concert with Bruno Walter in New York, and mm -hmm. to make my first recording uh, with uh, Columbia, the Mahler Second Symphony. And then, I guess... Everybody thinks singing at the Metropolitan Opera was the biggest thrill of my life. It wasn't really, and because that was that sort of came about. And the role I did was not very exciting. It was a five-minute role in a five-hour opera, and by that time everybody's you know had too much dinner and they're getting a little <laughs> sleepy, and they had me way out what we call West End Avenue, were behind a great big mountain of furniture, and I came up and my little head came over and I said, "Vice, you old time vice," and they said, "Where is he? I can't really see here." And I'm pretty big; it's hard to miss me. But anyway. <laughs> But I suppose that's some sort of peak in my life. Mm -hmm. But every concert that I do is a, is a special concert to me. And I hope I never really change because if you become a little jaded and you say, oh, God, I've got to go out and, and do a little, you know, another concert or another date here or another trip and you're bored, then you sound as bored as you yeah, are, you are or you, yeah. that you look, you know. So you have to keep up that enthusiasm. And I really look, I always look forward to tomorrow. That's very special. Now, you have taken an awful lot of tours, huh? Yeah, too many. <laughs> Concert tours. Mm -hmm. yeah. You claim to have been traveling for 25 years That's of your truth. life. Hmm? That's the truth, really. What are the glamorous aspects of that, Maureen? Well, it, when, you're, when you first begin and you arrive and somebody comes to pick you up in a big Cadillac limousine and a, a peaked uh, you know, chauffeur carries your luggage and you think it's not glamorous, and when you buy your first mink coat, and things like that yeah. seem to be very glamorous. And you go to a lot of receptions, and then after about 10 years, you realize they ask the same questions, and it becomes a little tiring. But what really, really is exciting about traveling is people. Because you meet people in every country. They're a little bit different, but they end up being quite the same because they have the same interests in music, and they, but they teach you a lot about their country. Right. And I like to buy paintings in each country I go to because I feel it tells me a little bit about the people. I like handwork very much. I do a great deal of handwork myself. So I try to seek out the little shops that have special artisan works from the country I'm in. And I try to talk to people a lot. I talk to the waitress who waits on me in the dining room. I talk to the cab driver who takes me to the, you know, usually right. cab dri drivers talk to you whether you want to or not. But that's important. Have you got a favorite city other than Toronto? No, not really. I love London, and I like Vienna, and I like Moscow, and I, like, I tend to like big places. But you can get as big a thrill as being in the, the south of France and walking through a, a double field of great big sunflowers who seem to be saying, paying you homage as you go by, as you can in a big city. So it depends. Sometimes I go to a, a city, I say, oh, God, I'll never want to come back. The weather's terrible, like Amsterdam in the rain or something. But on the other hand, the next time I go, the, the flowers are all in bloom, and I say, oh, Amsterdam's a fabulous city, you see. You haven't, uh, so it's really not true when you said that I, 
I've been on the road for 25 years. I wake up in motel, oh, not motels, but hotels now, and I don't really know what city Sometimes. I'm in. Sometimes that no. happens. If I'm very tired and I've had a 12-hour trip and I sort of go to bed and, you know, awaken by myself, I look around the room and it can be a Holiday Inn or, you know, one of mm. the big chains, and I say, they all look alike. Now, let me see where I am <laughs> today. You know, the movie, This is Tuesday, It Must Be Belgium. That yeah. does really that, happen that really from time happens. to time. I'm not nervous, says Maureen Forrest. No, I'm not nervous. I'm hysterical, but I'm not nervous. <laughs> As a person, I mean. <laughs> no, no. But no, for a performance, nervous. you're up. I'm up. I'm keyed up enough. I'm doing a first performance, a world performance of something. I'm very keyed up because I want it to go well and I want to do the composer justice. But on the other hand, I'm not really nervous. As I said to you at the beginning, I really am doing what I really like to do, and it's easy for me. Singing is very easy for me. You weren't even ner nervous for that farewell concert that Bruno Walter asked you to sing for, what, in 1956 yeah. it was? No, 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 I wasn't Because you really canceled nervous. a whole tour to do that. That yeah. was a turning point for you, right. wasn't that it? That was a big turning point because that was my very first concert in the United States. And that was very exciting. And you weren't, didn't have trouble sleeping the night before no, or no. digesting I, food? You know John Umark, who, who mm -hmm. has played for me for 25 years? When I did a, my first recital in New York City, and we were staying at a hotel, and he kept looking at his watch. It was about 25 after 8, and the concert was at 8.30, about 10 blocks away. And he couldn't find me. So, and he kept calling me, Maureen, what are you doing? We've got to be there. I said, John, I'm trying to glue on my nails, and the glue won't stick, and I don't know what to do. And he said, <laughs> having a heart attack and I was worried about my nails you know so you know it's a funny thing about women because if, if our hands look nice we do nice things with that don't you tend to go like this you know? <laughs> <laughs> and, and a recital is very important to me. <laughs> so my hands look well if 1956 <laughs> and the farewell concert to Bruno Walter was a turning point let's go back to some earlier turning points back All to right. Montreal where were you born in Montreal in the northeast end on a street called Fabre uh, between oh. Laurier and, and Saint Gregoire, and it's uh, the, the parish of Saint Stanislas. It's a, quite a famous parish in Saint Montreal. Saint Stanislas, yes. I'm from because Montreal. are you? Do you mm -hmm. know Montreal? Yes. Are you from Montreal? I've been away a long time. Oh well, me too, in mm -hmm. a way. But I still love Montreal. It's still basically my hometown, and uh, people in that neighborhood. It was a lower middle class uh, neighborhood. But they're so marvelous. I will meet people uh, shopping in Eaton's or something, walking along, say, Catherine Street in Montreal or Toronto that are former Montrealers. They say, you used to live at the back of me, and I remember when you were a little girl, blah, 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 or this. And other neighbors said, you know, we were going to have a sugaring party, and we decided to invite all the old people that used to live in the neighborhood. And somebody said, we should have invited her. And I, you wouldn't have come. I said, I would have. If I had been free, I would have come. I would have loved it. Yeah. I had a marvelous childhood. And often I think back about it because people say, oh, I had a terrible child and we were poor. There's nothing wrong with being poor if you had a good family life. And I had a terrific family. And I think Rich the, great, the, the, great, yeah, yeah. the great thing in our house was the one big expensive piece of furniture in our house was an upright piano. Every single festival, like it was Christmas or Easter or Sunday or whatever it was, we ended up around the piano singing because we didn't have money to go to the theater or go to the movies right. more, than, more yeah. than once a week. So we sang. Your mother's still living? No, my mother died a few years ago. She yes. lived long enough, though, to see all her oh, dreams for you come yes. true. Oh, yeah. yes. And the most touching thing of my mother's life is that my sisters, I have two sisters, a brother who died a few years ago, but my two sisters always felt, well, she was the lucky one. She had the voice. We all had voices. I, I'm just extroverted enough to have made a career, perhaps, of singing. Right. But, um, you know, what was I going to tell you? I just see how... Well, your mother, the, yeah, my she mother. lived long enough. Oh, yeah, she was, she was very ill in the hospital. And the last day of her life, you know how mothers say, oh, I love the German leader, and I love the French songs, and I like the Spanish, I like this. When are you going to make an, a record in English? So I had a CBC recording that was all English songs of Healy Willen and all kinds of lovely songs, Vaughan Williams. And I took it into the hospital to her, and she was very ill, and she was... As a matter of fact, blind and paralyzed at the time. But she was still a very vain woman. She would never let me know that she couldn't see me. And I played this recording for her. And the doctor came and said, Oh, Mrs. Forrester, that's lovely to hear your daughter sing. And she said, Ah, oh, yes, music has been my whole life. And with that, she went to sleep. And she never woke up. It was the most beautiful ending for me to remember of a mother who was ill for a long time. Because she meant it. Music was her whole life, and she really was reliving her life through me as an older woman because she'd always wanted to be a singer. And she came from a very sort of straight-laced Irish family who considered going on the stage, you know, you know going to the dogs. Right. And uh, it was what lovely. A, what a I was nice just, story. Yeah. What a nice story. That's very nice. Studied piano at five. Yeah. Began voice lessons at 17. Yes. A miracle at 16, though, when your voice went from soprano 
to contralto. Well, like a boy. Some boys' voices change, and girls' voices. The altos, you know, don't develop until they're in their late teens. But there's less of them than there are sopranos, right? Oh, yeah, much less. I mean, <laughs> we always say sopranos instinctively hate each other, or they're very envious and jealous of each other. Altos all like each other. And everywhere we go, we recommend each other because we know we're very few, and eventually <laughs> they're going to have to get back to us in about five years. <laughs> this is good, yeah. yeah. Now, you were bilingual, being born and raised yeah, in Montreal. Right, right. But along the way, you picked up seven languages, essential for the career that you were to go into. Yeah, right? mind you, I sing in about 24. 24. I was amazed. Last, last Christmas I was making um, a recording of Christmas songs from around the world, and I was trying to pick things, and I, I, I didn't realize I could sing in 24 languages. I can't speak them all. I would love to. How many can you speak? I, well, I speak a little Spanish and Italian, of course, and German, French. Right. Wow. All it badly. <laughs> English included. <laughs> There's another miracle that comes along with the, after the voice change, and that's the former publisher, the late publisher of the Montreal, Montreal Star. Star, Mr. McConnell. That's a very beautiful story because this was a great man, a great philanthropist who never publicized the things he did. Well, for, for a very good reason. Every mother with a talented child would be at his doorstep, I presume. But he read in the newspaper. Now, you know, we talk about critics and uh, how they can destroy a career. But in this case, this was a very nice thing. Eric McLean of the Montreal Star, who still writes for the Star, wrote a little article saying... This young lady is, is sort of an up-and-coming young singer in Montreal and homegrown. But isn't it a pity she has to sing so much in order to further her career because she's at the point where she should study and whatnot, go away and maybe study. So he had me investigating, Mr. McConnell, J.W. McConnell. After reading the article. Yes, and he called Eric McLean in and asked him about me, whether he thought I was, you know, a, a sort of a winner. And uh, he called me, and it was a very good point in my life. My father was very ill. It, I think died a few months later, and he sat be opposite me and said, you know, my dear, you can have as much money as you want to study and stop singing. And I said, you see, but I'm not at that point in my career. What I really need is for somebody to pick up the deficit. And the most astounding thing is that I would be, well, you know, I'd be invited, for instance, to sing in Vancouver, and they'd say, well, it's the Bach Choir of Vancouver, and we'd love to do the Alder Rhapsody of Brahms, and we need a contralto soloist, and we have $200. Would you do it? $200 was a lot of money to me. Right. I said, I'd love to, but in those days, it would cost me $700 between the fare and the everything else and a few extra singing lessons and buy a dress and have my hair dressed. So I was going to be out of pocket $500, which was impossible. Well, for two years, I did... I had a fabulous career of singing everywhere I was engaged, and it cost him $20,000. So it, when people realize, you know, that there's so much talent that goes down the drain, mainly because they can't afford to get from being uh, a graduate from school to a professional, to building up uh, a reputation where you're, you're, you can uh, command different fees. So he was the bridge. He was the bridge, and a great man, and really the means of my making a career. I wouldn't have been able to do it, I don't think. I would have stayed a local singer and, and perhaps ended up teaching in a school, perhaps. Or maybe it would have just taken you longer. Maybe. Because hmm? mm -hmm. the talent was there. Mm -hmm. First uh, important, well, a debut in 19, what, 56 in the town hall in New York? Right. Mm -hmm. That was a turning point because that's how Bruno yes, Walter heard about right. you. Right. right. Uh -huh. um, you delayed getting into opera up until 1962 here in Canada and I think 1966 in the United right. States. I'll tell you why. why. I'll tell you why. Because as an alto, you tend to play the mothers and the maids and the other woman and then, you know, the roles are about this big. Uh, it's vanity, really, because I always feel if I want to sing, I want to sing for the whole night. I want to have you in the palm of my hand for the whole night, you see. Well, and also my voice changed a great deal. The range of my voice, you know what I mean by the range, the mm -hmm. ability to sing very high or very low. I mean, it was a more medium range, and I could sing a recital in several languages and plan the keys I was singing. Certain roles that I now am able to sing, have, having more experience, I couldn't sing even 15 years or even 10 years ago. Yeah. So I put off doing them. I mean, I love acting. A lot of people tend to think, oh, concert singers, they're very stately. You know, they stand like this on the stage, and they, they're sort of all in. The Germans call it Innigkeit, and it's very boring. <laughs> but it isn't really, because if you think about it, every three minutes I'm singing a song about something else, and I have to convey with my eyes a little scene without the action. Right. So that acting on the stage in an opera is just an extension of that. 
So, but I always like to say, in opera, I feel that I'm a better character actress than I would have been in the heroine. I'm not really Carmen, because I laugh at myself as Carmen. I don't really believe that I'm the sexiest thing walking across the stage, so forget it, you know, then I can't convey the part. But I'm, I can make you laugh or cry. I'm good at the extremes. So now that I'm getting older, I'm 46 years old, I'm, I'm even better <laughs> at extremes, you see. I can play all the witches and all the nasty ladies and all the funny ladies and feel I can bring it off. But part of the reason you delayed was you wanted the voice to develop. Right? The voice was developed. And one must know how to take a step at a time. If you want to sing at the Metropolitan Opera at the age of 23 and sing a role like Electra, uh, you know, of Strauss, you won't be singing by the time you're 30 because the role is too demanding and nothing takes the place of time. The voice develops slowly, it grows, and your experience, and you learn how to be clever and how to act with the voice and use more color. Because singing is really like painting. It's a palette of colors, and you sing. I always say, I'm going to sing a purple sound or a, or a shimming silver sound or something. But I didn't know how to do that 15, 20 years ago. And it's by listening to myself on a great many recordings, I found that I found very often I sounded very dull, dull as dishwasher, a great housewife singing, you know, on the stage, and realized in order to be exciting, to give the audience a th at least once a night a thrill, sometimes you have to make a, an unpleasant sound. But you give them a little variety, so it doesn't sound like wallpaper, right? Maureen, uh, all, everything that you've just said sounds very wise. No, <laughs> I'm not <very> wise. <laughs> no, I'm just wondering, was oh, it a, a, a teacher you had that, that uh, guided you this way, or did you have this innate sense of wisdom of take your time, mm -hmm. the time will come, don't rush your career, don't go until you're ready? Was this all out of your I've own I've really maturity? never been in a hurry, mainly because I've always made a great deal of money at singing. So I didn't have to learn something in order to, for the next phase to take place. It, my career really developed with very good advice from conductors and whatnot. But I must say, not, you know, you must have good teaching. And I have a very fine, solid technique. I can be as sick as a dog and give you a fairly good performance and you're not aware of I don't feel well. I may know that it's not a, what it was last week or may not be as good as next week. But... I feel people come and pay money to see me. They don't, don't want an excuse. I never go out and say, please excuse me today, I have a cold. Oh, and I can have hay fever or whatever. Yeah. I could sneeze and I'll have a handkerchief over the middle. And the minute I walk out on the stage, I don't sneeze and I don't cough. And I don't have a frog in my throat. And that's, I guess, being a professional. But that basically comes from good training. And I had a marvelous teacher named Bernard Diamond who teaches here in Toronto at the University. I didn't study very long with him. I didn't have to. And he was the type of man who said, now, this is the way you do it, but you have to do it. I can't do it for you. You go home and you practice. And by listening to yourself and never really being satisfied to yourself, you grow and you develop. And I learned a great deal from great people I've worked with all these years. But did you, I, really, I love to teach, by did the way. You, yeah, I know. Did you ever, uh, you know, 10 years ago, were you ever telling your manager or whoever looks after you, I want to try the mat, you know, just for the ego thing, and they were saying, no, 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 wait, wait, no. be patient. No, as a matter of fact, years ago, people tried to push me into various things, and I'd say, no, I don't feel I could really come off well doing Do that. you know yourself well? In uh, very well, very well. And there's still, there still certain works. Oh, the, I, I've occasionally taken on something and felt it wasn't bad, but it wasn't good enough. I don't think I'll do that again, wow. you know. Without anybody telling you? Yeah, without anybody telling you. Well, the critics say, well, it was a fairly good performance. Not as good as so-and-so's recording or so-and-so. But then you say, well, should I really continue doing that work? It's not really for me. And I, I add and eliminate all the time. I like to do a great many new works because it keeps me interested in, in developing, mm. and, you know, a little. What about the training? Hours yeah. every day? No, I don't, I don't vocalize because I sing too much. I do 120 performances a year, which is insanity. Most people should do about 50. And my real problem in life is I don't know how to say no. Somebody will come along and say, oh, I always plan to have holidays. And they say, oh, we want to do this benefit or you know, we want to do this opera. And we have to have you because the conductor likes working with you. You don't give them a hard time. And, just blah, 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 blah. and I always say, oh, all right, I'll do it just this once. You know. But in the early years, hard training? Hard training, I wouldn't say it was hard. It's just you you have to learn to develop the vo voice technique. So as I say on a bad day, you sing the way you do on a good day. But that the hard thing in a career is to find a good teacher. And singing, unfortunately, 
anybody can be a singing teacher. They put a little plaque out and they say, I'm a singing teacher. You don't have to prove that you can sing and say, well, I had a very short career. I was ill when I was young and my voice is gone, but I know how to teach. That's not quite true. If you teach piano, you have to sit down and demonstrate. If you teach the violin, you have to be able to demonstrate. And singing, if a young person wants to sing, they should make sure and get advice from people who to go to. Go to your local conservatory and ask where should I study voice and have a test at the conservatory or something so that you get the right teacher because you can't buy a new voice. You can buy a new violin or you can buy a new piano, but you cannot buy a new voice. And if somebody teaches you badly and you destroy your vocal apparatus, you've had it. You, because you're so sensitive and so aware of your own potential and limitations and, you know, time and all that stuff, must be very aware of how exactly your voice is changing from year to year. Yes. When you're 25 years old, your voice is at its peak and it sounds luscious and gorgeous. From then on, it's a question of technique and knowing how to use it cleverly. I once saw an interview with uh, Callas, and Callas, as you know, was a great singing actress. She, I feel she doesn't sing anymore, and, and, and people analyze, they say, oh, she went on a diet and she lost too much weight. It's not that at all. If you've ever seen her on the stage, she gave 150 per, percent every note. Well, you can't do that. Mm -hmm. You have to know when to hold back and when to save so that you save for the moments of peaks. You ca it can't be all peaks all night. It's tiring for the audience, too. Where's the mouth? Maureen, they describe you as uh, marvelously calm, an untroubled performer. You well, have I'm calm. <laughs> <laughs> you've got to be kidding. You can hear my kids if you think I'm calm. <laughs> now, hear this, you know. <laughs> I'm normal. Most the people that you work no. with, are you a little bit of an outsider? Or do you find them much more temperamental and uh, much more explosive than you are? No. The most successful people are very ordinary. I would say ordinary in the sense I don't mean any, every, every performer normal. is an extrovert. But the busier you are, the more normal you become. I mean, your, your, your main thought for the day is, what am I going to have for dinner tonight? You know? Mm. I mean, the performance of the thing is wonderful. It's something you do and you love doing. It's like your job, you love your job. So, you know, you're oh, I wish they were all like you. Nervous. You know, we've only got a few moments left and oh. we've left out part three of our title. Oh, what was it going to be? <laughs> the children. Oh, yeah, the children. I've got, I'm very blessed. I have marvelous, marvelous children. And so often, this is a whole other program, but people say, yeah. you're poor children, you're away 90% of the year. I love my children and they love me and that's the essence of everything. You don't have to be together 24 hours no. a day. But if they know that you have this ter terrific love for them, you don't have a problem with children. And I talk to them every single day of my life, and I solve many arguments on the telephone. But what I really want to say, and it's very important, my word is, word. I'm boss. Final. And if it's an argument and I make a decision, that's it. On the other hand, I never like to say they can't have an opinion. Everybody's entitled to opinion. But when it comes to very, something very serious, I say, well, when you, when you have your children, you make a decision. But right now, I make the decision. But Still, with all the traveling, with the great success, um, if there are any regrets, is it along those lines that you wish you could have spent a little more time with them? Oh, of course. Yeah. Of course. I mean, I would love to have them with me 24 hours a day. Right. Not only because I miss them, because I'll come home. I sometimes have, you know, killed myself to get home overnight, and I get home and I said, they say, gee, hi, Mom, just one of them, lovely to see you. i got to go to a basketball game. You see, that's how much they miss me. They're happy to know I'm home, but they have a life of their own, and that's natural. Many mothers feel terrible about that, and artists, they feel, oh, my daughter doesn't love me. She just never spends any time with me. She's not home for dinner again tomorrow night. That's, mar that's the best thing you can give your children is independence, and that they've cut the apron string. You've done a good job if mm -hmm. they can manage on their own. Are they musical at all? They're very musical, and my children are very close. We, if we have Christmas at home or any celebration of any kind or a birthday, Somebody will say, Paul will say, what do you mean you're not coming home today? You cancel whatever you We're This is a family do and we're together and that's it. A and we love it, of course. A parting shot. Say something about small towns in Canada. You did a tour of there Saskatchewan. There are no small towns. No there are small, no small towns. You know why? Because of television. Because you go into everybody's home. And, and I walk along the street in a small town. I arrive, you know, drive 200 miles after I get off in, in Regina and get to a, a small town. And somebody will come along the street and they smile at me. 
And I think, do I know that person? And I realize, no, but they know me because they've seen me on television and they feel they know me. And the most beautiful thing that happens, and it happened to me, I did a tour for the touring office of the Canada Council, when a little old lady comes up with tears in her eyes and says to you and really means it, you know, dear, I never thought I'd get to touch you in my lifetime. Couldn't have a better compliment.